Thank you, Anova Abbott, for having me sit here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sita. Um, out of the wish to benefit others, I visualize you upon the fresh lotus in my heart. May the melodious sound of your nectar-like speech, O Manjushri, confer its splendor upon my mind. These words from Mipam Rinpoche I invoke as I sit down here to have a conversation with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. And uh, what else is there to discuss in our life but the necessity for us to take refuge, to find a place of refuge, and to be that refuge for others. We can only be a refuge for others if we ourselves know where to take refuge in. And the only refuge that we have uh, is the pure, awakened mind that we are, Prashna Paramita, the perfection of that wisdom that knows, that loves, that is compassionate, skillfulness towards ourselves and others. That's our mind. That's the basis of our mind. That's our Buddha nature. It's our awakened nature that we already are. So that's a good news here in Buddhism is uh, we don't need to search outside. It's already right here, our awakened nature our pure, awakened mind, that's love, that's wisdom, it's right here. So, how do we approach this? How we are this? How are we bring it into the world? These are these questions that um, keep coming up. And, um, And uh, the founder of this particular practice lineage that we find ourselves in, this temple here, Dogen Senshi, um, he describes this practice path through the gateway of refuge when he says, the Buddhas and ancestors, authentic transmission through India and China is reverent devotion to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Without taking refuge, there is no devotion. Without devotion, there is no taking refuge. The merit and virtue of taking refuge is realized through responsive communion between sentient beings and Buddhas. Devotion and responsive communion between Buddhas and uh, sentient beings. So, of course, you immediately are, you're so uh, trained in wanting to make distinctions. So, where is that Buddha and where is that sentient being? And, uh, we have our habits. We have our habits in making that distinction. Um, and at the same time, I do um, want to invite us today to turn into the skillful means of the Buddhas, helping us using that distinction um, to get out of distinction. For example, one of the examples of those skillful means is um, the refuge ceremony. Some of you have gone through the refuge ceremony. And um, actually, it seems like there is a time before the ceremony, then you go through the ceremony and there's a time after and something has changed. And I particularly myself um, would confess that that refuge ceremony has been a huge change in my life. At the same time, you are able to take refuge right now without having gone through a ceremony. You can take refuge to Buddha, take refuge to Dharma, 
and take refuge to Sangha at this very moment. And it has an effect. For example, I read this beautiful story of uh, Tangan Harada Roshi, um, the teacher of both um, the abbot and Kukyusan. He told the story that um, he, they had a dog. I'm not sure you guys saw that dog. Koro was, anyhow, they had a dog in a temple where his most venerable practiced. And that dog was sick and survey and old. And so one day when Harada, uh, Tangan Harada Roshi went outside the gate, he saw that dog lying uh, in the sun on the gate of the temple and not breathing. So he went to the dog and took the dog in the arm and said, uh, Namu kiyo butsu, namu kiyo ho, namu kiyo sa. I take refuge in Buddha, I take refuge in Dharma, I take refuge in Sangha. And the moment he said that, the first time the dog, the breathless dog, opened the mouth and howled. And then he repeated, I take refuge in Buddha, I take refuge in Dharma, I take refuge in Sangha. And this dead, dying dog again howled, and so is the third time. And in the way how um, Tangana Radharoshi explains the story is that this dog had made a connection to the Dharma, to the Buddha, to awakening, to eating all these leftover from, from the monks that collected the arms from devotees, aided to nourish their practice, and then whatever was left over was fed to the dog. So the dog made a connection. And hearing, hearing these words at the time of his passing had an impact, had an effect. So there's a conditioning and so the exposure to the blessing, to the power of awakening that has an effect no matter how dull we are, how much desperate we are. So there's power there in taking refuge. There's extreme power. And again, why is there power there? Because it's not something from outside. It's our own mind that's right here, that's awakening, that's separation. I myself um, just came from the airplane. I came from Manjushri Pada, the land that was founded by Manjushri. Manjushri Pada is... Um, another word for Nepal. It's um, the place where Manjushri has seen, and with his divine eye, a beautiful lotus on the bottom of a lake. And he wanted others to see that lotus too, so he cut, uh, cut into the mountain and trained the lake, um, exposing Nepal as it is today. Kind of stories like this, uh, Bringing is the story is to bring us wisdom closer. So who is Manjushri? Manjushri is a, a bodhisattva, one of a very high realized bodhisattva, so close to awakening that um, it's he, that he is, has a power and the capacity of Buddha and awakening himself. And at the same time, as a 10 stage bodhisattva, it is said that he sees. Um, um, the Dharma realm, the Dharmakaya, in the same way as a newborn child is seeing the sun uh, in the room that it's born. So there are stages of our ability to see this awakening that we are and, um, and respecting that helps us to utilize that power. Only if we find our place right now, do we know um, how to use skillfulness to unpack ourselves into that awakening that we are. So there is a sense of humility that can come along with um, respecting power. And once one knows power, one is able to use it. Just like, for example, electricity. If one is applying to the power of electricity, one can easily get killed. One uses it unskillfully, right? 
But if you know the power of electricity, you know how to be able to use it into lighting a room brightly or dimly, however you want it. That's skillfulness. So again, approaching the power of our mind that is so powerful that it can penetrate through any darkness and any confusion whatsoever. We, um, we approach and see beings um, because we want relationship. It is this communion that Dogen was saying about that helps us use a piece of wood and carve an image out of it that is trying to guide us towards that understanding. In the beginning, when I um, went to any religious path, I was pretty small, um, just being um, in church in my local town, I was always like, um, so why was it talking about, you know, um, this being that um, supposed to be better than me? And it was bothering me, actually, to have constantly an... Um, kind of religious figure in front of me that's supposed to be better. So if when we're talking about stages and differentiations in awakening, again, we're not talking about a better. There's no better. Like It's the difference between the uh, sky being full of clouds or free of clouds. Is the sky any way better with or without clouds? I think that's a distinction that's utterly useless. And yet it has so much power, such a tiny distinction has so much power. If anything that generates suffering in this world, it really are afflictive emotions, like the emotions to say, I hate rain and I want sun. How miserable one can get just like adhering to that kind of distinction all day. So afflictive emotions, um, there are five, multiple, endless afflictive emotions, and we can see them in the news laid out, like really um, detailed. Um, in Buddhism, they're boiled down to five. That's greed, hate, and delusion, the main ones that uh, get us into trouble. But then also jealousy and pride, um, which are very subtle and they can sneak up on us exactly by making this distinction of like, why is somebody better than me? Or why am I, uh, uh, you know, nobody's seeing how good I am and they're just really stupid. So this kind of distinction of kind of situating ourselves continuously in a network of differentiation and assumptions um, um, brings a certain trouble with us that just gets us more and more entangled with the objects of our mind rather than really seeing our mind how it really is. It gets us entangled with the clouds. It gets us stuck into the weather patterns instead of really just appreciating that there is a sky and, uh, and there is sun and there is sun. And that sun again is this power that we take refuge in. It's the sun that can dispel the clouds that we take refuge in. So again, talk a little more about um, this refuge that Dogen here in this quote uh, proposed to be a communion, a communion between the awakened one and the one not yet, between the sun and the clouds, so to speak. In this communion, um, we put, um, because we want relationship, we are you know, so yearning for um, support, language, language that can guide us, different like differentiation. And yet the very thing that we seek is that which is free of differences, free of reference points. So how much is that uh, attention, right? Like constantly guiding our way through language, through stories, through images. And yet at the same time, that very thing that we are seeking is free of that. So here in Queen Gulch, um, we have a representation of this awakening in form of Manjushri. Manjushri um, uh, made a vow 
to reside at Mount Wutai in China. So I'm not sure if any of you have ever traveled there, but um, he made this vow if, um, to show up there, whoever seeks there for him. And if he, uh, you know, if he wouldn't, he would, his head would split in a thousand pieces. So he has a strong vow of being right there. And there are a lot of pilgrims have made it to that place uh, in order to look for him. And there's one story of uh, a fellow from uh, Tibet. Uh, he's like total Manjushi devotee, and he wanted, really wanted to go to Mount Wutai, meeting Manjushri in person, like really meeting him. And um, yes, it's a story of somebody seeking outside. So he goes there and um, he doesn't have much money. So he's like parking, uh, camping in the backyard of uh, an inn. And um, and so he goes there shouting out the name of Manjushri on the mountain and at night coming back to the inn trying to get some rest. And the inn at night is totally busy with partying young teenagers. And um, so he can't have a look at them because he can't sleep. They're partying really loud. And, um, and he notices one particular young fellow who, you know, is flirting with all the girls and, uh, you know, uh, challenging the boys. And the young uh, fellow notices him too. And he's like, what are you doing here? You know, like, yeah, I'm looking for Manjushri. And, you know, I'm, he said, he's going to show up. And I'm like, I've been looking here for three weeks already. I have not seen him. And uh, so the fellow says, you know, it's getting winter soon. You better go. You know, it's getting Mount Wutai is really cold. It's high elevation. You better go. You know, there's nobody here called Manjushri. Uh, and the fellow was by that time really tired. He's like, okay, okay. So, but since where are you going? Where are you going back to? You know, how are you going back? He's like, well, I guess it goes through Mongolia. You know, it's already snow coming. So I'm going back, back to Tibet, through so Mongolia. And this young boy says, like, oh, okay, well, if you go to Mongolia, I know somebody there. Why do you do? take a letter uh, from me with you? I'm like, okay. So he has his name on the letter, whatever it is, Sam or whatever. And uh, he takes a letter, goes to Mongolia, you know, weeks later and comes to this place where he's supposed to deliver this letter to this person. And goes to the entire town, entire village, like, do you know somebody called Sam? Do you know somebody Sam? No, no, nobody knows. And then finally, before he gives up, an old woman approaches him and says, um, oh, I know, Sam, uh, we have a pig back there in the last alley, you know, why don't you, that's the only Sam we know. He's like, okay, it's what, so what, you know? So he goes, goes to the pig, opens the letter and shows it to the pig. And the pig just stares at the letter, like you can see a teardrop, and it falls dead. And he's like, what happened, you know? So he reads the letter, and the letter says, Dear Sam, your task in that town in Mongolia is over. Please come back to Mount Wutai. And then uh, Manchufi. Signed by Manchufi, and this fellow finally realizes that Manjushri was there, he didn't see him. So how often do we see Manjushri and don't see him? How often do we aim for one thing and miss the other? I'm pretty um, learned, not learned here too, so um, I'm learned, leaning here on Nagarjuna, who has this beautiful praise of Manjushri that I want to read. And I want to read it because, you know, in this uh, trying to learn this communion with the awakened beings, we're going about our way. And what is our way? It's a human way. So if we have a guest, we give, make offerings to them. We give them some water, some cookies to eat. If you have a guest come, uh, we might say something nice to them, like, wow, you have a nice sweater on, or 
you look so fresh and young. So we praise them, we, you know, relate to them. And uh, why not relate like that to awakening? They are forms of awakening that are our mind, that are remind us of our mind. And, um, and before I do, I will uh, praise, praise. I will only say about this form a little bit more. Because again, so here's this tension. It's a form. It looks like a person, right? Like source of you see the statue. It's one face, two arms, cross-legged, holding a staff. Looks like a human. It doesn't look like an elephant, doesn't look like a snake. So here's awakening in the form of a human. Um, and yet there's some symbolism, some silent communication going on. Um, the face is a symbol for the single fear of Dhammadatu. Two arms are representing skillfulness of compassion and wisdom. The cross legs um, symbolizing the equality of existence and peace. So these are some teachings that are like carved into the form, into this wood, into an image. Further, peaceful deities like Manchushri sitting here among us in the form of this image of a young boy, a large young boy, he um, is said to have a subtle body, a slender body, which is symbol for his pure birth. He has a pliable body, which is a purification of all disease. And it's an upright body, which is a purification of death. And his usefulness is a purification of old age. So the image of Manjushri is that of the freedom of birth, old age, sickness, and death. The one single sphere of the one reality that we all share. And uh, the knowledge and love that we are in our mind. So as I read this praise of Nagyachuna, why don't you uh, explore receiving it? So if Manjit represents the nature of our mind, why not receive it? Fully receive it. And when you come to the end of your ability to receive it as your own mind, just rejoice in it being Manjushri. Manjushri, that which is here for us to relate to, to ask for, to knock on a gate, to learn about our own mind. So you can go back and forth between this is you or this is awakening that you want to be. Homage to useful Manjushri. You do not arrive and you do not depart. You do not rise and you do not remain. You thoroughly transcend this world. Yours is a domain beyond words. O protector, how should I praise you? As the world conceives of you, just so I too exalt and honor you in my devotion for you, O Guru. By your very nature, you are unborn. For you, there can be no arising. Protector, who neither comes nor goes, to you, the insubstantial, I offer homage and praise. You are neither real nor unreal, neither void nor everlasting, neither constant nor transitory, to you, the non-dual, I offer homage and praise. You're not red or green or crimson. You're not yellow, white or black. You do not have any color at all. To you, the colorless, I offer homage and praise. You are neither large nor small, neither heavy set nor slender. Your form is neither tall nor short. To you, the sizeless, I offer homage and praise. In your wisdom, you're not confined to existence. Out of compassion, you do not dwell in peace. 
You do not remain in either samsara or nirvana. To you, the non-abiding, I offer homage and praise. You do not reside in phenomena. Yours is a realization of all things. You are sustained by supreme profundity. To you, the profound, I offer homage and praise. Like this, I could exalt you repeatedly, for how else might I offer you praise? In the emptiness of all phenomena, who is there to offer praise? To whom? You have no limits, no center. To you, the inconceivable, beyond perceiver and perceived, I offer homage and praise. This is the expression of the ultimate attributes of the Guru and Protector Manshu Gosha. Through the merits of this, may this world come to resemble the one gone to bliss. I want to open up to questions and comments in order to make this more of a conversation. But I forgot the clock after all. Since there's no question yet, I will add some more. So you can stir your mind a little bit. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, some of us go through the ceremony of taking refuge and um, since we are coming from this kind of Abrahamic background, um, ceremonies are sometimes seen as, you know, like um, a one-time event. And um, in particular, this refuge ceremony, it took me myself a while to like see, it's not just, it's not like seen, it's not like a baptism of some sort, you know, like you're like part of a club now, or you like, um, you know, you did this one thing and this kind of brands you, that kind of branding. Um, it actually is more like, like I said, you can take refuge right now. You can go in front of an image of the Buddhas, take refuge, or you can, um, in your own mind, just really yearn and call out for the refuge to as a vacant one. All of that is fine. Uh, a ceremony itself just marks um, it in in front of everybody, kind of giving a momentum, giving a strength. Ceremonies are very powerful um, um, and levels that are like beyond the intellect, like just really helping yourself um, making the step before beyond the intellectual reasonings. And um, and then it's also this way of um, so getting the support net for yourself to continue refuge, because refuge is a daily practice. Um, the founder of this lineage, Dogen himself, by the time before he died, he had a pillar in his room and he would walk around the pillar taking refuge over and over. So refuge is actually an hourly, momentary, daily practice. And the ceremony helps to um, remind you and collect the support network through community and teachers um, and sangha friends to continue this practice. So how would this practice now um, look in your um, daily life? Um, because of course the words itself are very um, intellectual, right? Like I take refuge in Buddha and then what is Buddha? What does refuge mean? You know, is there anything different now? Am I supposed to feel different? All of that. Um, I feel the hands on refuge is really again this um, open, just an open heart. 
having an open heart that um, allows to go beyond our ideas, our opinion, our prejudices. Uh, and it's this open heart that is also the gateway um, of love that we are, for the love to come through that we are. And it's this open heart that also allows for flexibility. And um, one way how this open heart is being practiced is by remembering impermanence. Impermanence uh, evokes sadness. And of course, that's, um, you know, we are, we are often more engaged in, in, in creating something and establishing something. So remembering impermanence is counter to that. Um, it really reminds that everything we do is actually bound to fall apart. So it can be, um, you know, initially discouraging to be like, why would I want to focus on, you know, um, that which falls apart? Yeah, and why are we doing this? Because it's leading us to this openness of our heart. This openness that is that is love, that is us, that is our true, you know, the sun the behind the clouds. Um, that's a mind of renunciation, renouncing the objects in our experience and really falling back into um, into the present moment, into the present experience, and into an acceptance of what is at this time um, experienced and like an acceptance of the stories, like letting them um, stop the engagement for for at least some time to to have that openness engulf you and engulf everybody around you. And I feel like to some extent, many of you probably um, have that experience over and over and just looking for ways to stabilize it. Particularly those who joined the practice period and are about to go into Sashin, that is exactly the time to learn to stabilize that openness that we are, that awakening that we are. Um, Sashin, as you will hear tonight, is this time to really care for this concern for awakening. And for this concern and the true being of ourselves that is an open heart. And there are many practices throughout the day that will support that. And some of these practices might encourage you to at home to uh, um, apply that too, or even so it's harder, it is harder. It is not easy in your workplace or in your family life um, in the middle of a lot of demands to um, to really stay open. That's why we go into retreat and solitude. That's why we take time out. Um, like right now, you are taking time out. Um, and so Seshin in particular, um, you are in one group, so it really helps to show up, do your schedule, because your neighbor probably very much appreciates having you there, having that uh, comfort of a fellow sitter right there. Then uh, being in silent, being uh, really focused on one's mind helps to not fall into these different um, images and stories that we constantly perpetuate. Uh, just, you know, knowing that whatever's going on in the mind, these are the clouds. There is a cloudless sky and striving or not striving, not quite the right word, the, having devotion to that having devotion to that cloud, the sky, even though if there's clouds there, just having, keep having that devotion. And then having uh, images like Manchashree in the center here, uh, reminding us that it is possible in this very body, in this very life, to achieve, to uh, manifest, to actualize, to verify this awakening. And um, in this way, for example, the secret instructions, for example, of our yogi is you are feeding Manchushri. You are, you are nurturing, awakening. When you, um, 
walk down the hall, you know, if you see something beautiful, you are offering it to awakening. If you see a flower, you're offering it, you rejoice. If you see somebody else do something beautiful, you rejoice, you're happy. Like some server is doing a good job, you were happy, you rejoice. Rejoicing, celebrating, being open to um, what's happening. It's so simple. And yet we need that support. So any questions about that? There's a question from the online Sangha. Can you clarify how one takes steps for deepening taking refuge in the Buddha? This is from John. Hi, John. So what is Buddha? Buddha is the unconditioned, that which is unconditioned. So contemplating impermanence, contemplating how what we see is compounded, is temporary. Everyone we know will have to die. We ourselves will have to die. Contemplating impermanence is a huge step towards uh, the unconditioned. Seeing things like a dream, like a waterfall, like a bubble, seeing it as kind of temporary, knowing everything, no matter if it's like a really painful image or a joyful image, knowing it to be temporary is a huge step towards opening to the unconditioned, opening to that which is beyond words, beyond conceptual constructions. And then knowing that no outer um, circumstances giving us this awakening. There is no handing over of anything. It's realized through self-awareness. It's realized it's in our own mind. It's a dawning of like the dawning of the sun in our own mind. And that can happen instantly. There is no time like there's no like okay you have to do x y and c and only then it can happen instantly we do not know what the cause and conditions of our past have been obviously they have been pretty well because you wouldn't have been interested in the dharma you wouldn't have the interest in awakening in in buddha if you didn't have already um kind of a momentum of that in your life, a momentum and an experience. I can very much imagine that all of you have an experience of the unconditioned already, that you all already have experience of love and care in your life. And because of that, that interest in awakening, that bodhicitta, that mind that wants more of that is there. So it's really just jumping on a surfboard and riding that wave and nurturing it and and perpetuating more of that activity, of that interest in that opening. So, concretely, contemplate impermanence. Yes. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I really like uh, you bringing up the devotional aspects of practice. Um, I guess I would admit as someone who's very westernized and grew up you know, in Abrahamic traditions, feels very unnatural, um, at least initially, um, kind of devoting to bodhisattvas and Buddhas and all of kind of the mythology, you know, stories around them. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on how to ease into devotional practice, whether it's devoting to a quality like compassion or love, or whether it's, um, you know, devoting to bodhisattvas, Buddhas in some other capacity. Yeah. Devotion itself is a hard um, practice. And, um, and yet at the same, I find 
our culture, myself included, we, um, we uh, e more easily step into it through what's called rational devotion. So rational devotion being, um, uh, which you already do all the time, for example, like, you know, um, if you find, oh, I'm really tired in the morning and I drink green tea that helps me perk up and be ready for my work, then then you, um, and you might develop a practice of uh, drinking green tea every morning out of that, one could call that rational devotion of like having a certain conviction in um, the efficacy of something. And um, so in that regard, if, if one, um, for example, uh, finds that, you know, you're sitting, daily sitting, um, is helping you in your daily life, then it's, that is also a form of rational devotion to be like, I, I really feel different if I have sat in the morning or not, then one develops a practice out of that and one has faith in it and has kind of rational faith, yeah. So, and that's a kind of a form of um, commitment that comes out of it. So, so, so the difference to like devotion, I feel um, devotion very easily can be equalized as being, um, a, just being committed to something and um, nurturing something out of with faith. But it also may be in this hard quality it's this ability to uh, having to have affection. It's a it's a, an affection, and this affection really again comes out of this um, knowing your own self worth, knowing your own skills, your abilities, and enjoying that. Like really knowing yourself as being a precious person as a first stepping stone. They really know that nobody talks like you and nobody is drawing a cat like you, whatever. You know, like there are certain things that are like so unique. And when you die, these are the things that people will talk on your grave of that they're gonna miss. And, and that because of that, your world is richer. You know, this would not be the world without you, the world would not be like that. And part of me feels sad when I say that because I know how often actually people think they don't matter. And it really hurts. I mean, just looking at the suicide rate, it hurts. I think as a culture, we, um, we deprive ourselves by not celebrating us. So learning to celebrate us, learning to see our uniqueness, and, you know, in a humble way, too, we are um, impermanent. We, you know, and we need to still learn a lot. There's a lot there's to learn, you know, um, and to play with, to, to explore, um, not as a lack, but just as, you know, as an opportunity. So from that kind of place of kind of richness, I feel like maybe devotion really needs a sense of knowing your own riches. And once you know your own riches, it is so easy to love. It's just so easy to turn toward somebody else and admire their beauty and admire their, their uniqueness. And um, and it's also more easy to celebrate. Their parties become so easy. Um, and then if it comes to this awakening, the, the awakening, that really comes more and more and really marking within ourselves these tiny moments of awakening that are already there. We already have them. They are like... Like again, I really believe all of you had moments of awakening that are beautiful. It's just this moment of beauty that is beyond words. However it comes to you, it comes to people differently. Don't compare. 
they come differently to different people. And once those moments of awakening, they nurture them. Like it's a, they're like a spark in the dark. And can we like nurture that spark? Can, what are the ways to nurture it? And again, there are traditional ways to do that. Um, most of the ways are making offerings, making gifts. And, uh, and I hear you, there is this link between, well, if I want to make these gifts, I seem to have to make them to these images or traditional forms that I'm not quite yet comfortable with. Is that, did I hear you correctly? Yeah. So I think it's, it's there where, um, where I, I remember the story of a dear uh, Eno who was sitting over there, pretty desperate because she was very busy. <laughs> I think Enos are pretty busy. And she looked at Manchuri in her desperation and prayed to Manchuri. And later on, she ran around and told everybody to do the same thing because it really worked for her. It really did. And I remember that at that time, I was like, that's not me. We're glad it worked for you, but it's not me. And at the same time, somehow in some other way, I came around to the same pretty desperate moment, having a mantra tree statue right in front of me, praying really heavily, and it worked. So in that way, keep the door open. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if you say right now, oh, that's not me, it doesn't mean it loses the validity for that opportunity. It's there. It's like, it's like electric wire. How do we connect, you know? So you didn't find your way of connecting. It doesn't mean you won't find it. But um, I don't want to tell it to you because it's really your unique way of doing it. But listen to what other people say and don't dismiss it. Because there's a whole tradition of 2,500 years of people saying, this worked. Like the Eno, like this worked. And at one point we're like, oh, it true, it does work. Maybe not right now, not in this way, but in some way. Just keep at it. Just keep open to it and, and um, honor, the story, honor the stories. Um, you mentioned play, and I was just curious on how you bring play into your practice. Personally, through my husband, honestly speaking. <laughs> um, and also, again, remembering actually impermanence. Because um, um, the more uh, I'm German, I can get very serious. The Germans tend to be very serious and people and uh, think a lot and take, you know, um, and, and having um, the ability through impermanence, through the contemplation of impermanence, to, to loosen some of that seriousness. Um, you know, then there are so many moments where it's like, I don't agree with it. I don't think that's, you know, smart or helpful or whatever. But if that's what it is right now, and I don't need to mess with it, you know, like I don't need to add my prejudice and opinions on top of it. But I just let it. So it's kind of like, you know, um, the least tension, letting something be. And then once one is able to let it, um, not fighting it, not resisting it, then there is like some opportunity where actually maybe like one notices something one hasn't noticed before because one was so wrapped up in one's prejudice and opinion uh, about the situation that once that is kind of like, okay, it's an impermanent situation. It's really not what I want. It's not what I like, but that's what it is. And once that kind of like relaxation is already there, then one maybe notices something that hasn't noticed before. And 
And once one notices something one hasn't noticed before, one time curiosity can come up. And through that curiosity, um, then there are gateways to, to ask questions or to like propose something different, to be like, looks like this is what's happening. I'm not going to go into what I think about it, but why do you wear that green hat? <laughs> whatever you know just like play with it you know just like get something out from a different angle you know look for it and then like um the other person has the same chance to be like less serious or or the situation itself has the chance to present itself differently yeah makes sense yeah any other questions Manchushri, she's holding the microphone to Manchushri. That's <laughs> true. Hi, thank Hi. you for being here. I'm curious if you have a story or an experience um, from your time in Nepal recently um, that reminds you of some of the things you spoke about today, refuge, ritual, or any of the other things. Yes, I was in a, um, in a cave um, that was a... Um, powerful pilgrimage site, not only for Buddhists, but also for uh, people of the shy white faith. And, um, and that was an interesting um, merging because uh, Buddhists tend to be very um, quiet <laughs> and the shy whites were not into quiet. Uh, in fact, I had a drum and a cymbal at the same time and hitting it like really, really hard. And I was like, didn't quite, no, no rhythm, nothing. It was just like straight hitting. And I was like, you know, like the thing of like, I don't understand it. You know, I don't understand it. And over time, I like really, they're demonstrating power. Right? But then B Buddhists demonstrate power through being silent. So it was just this odd uh, way of being together in this cave. Um, yeah. So it was definitely the task for me to look for silence in the middle of, really loud noise and um, and at the same time I felt so moved by all of it I wouldn't want to miss any of it I wouldn't want to just be like I'm doing it this way and I don't want your way I wanted I wanted it all I wanted to silence and the noise at the same time and it was so helpful um, and particularly um, the devotion in that place like there was very really, was eight hour drive like horrendous roads and um but then i don't even know where those people came from like early in the morning at six o'clock a line longer than the football field which just wanting to go into that cave to pay homage to express devotion and um and probably if one would make an interview of everyone there, they would have all these different reasons, different viewpoints, whatever. But the expression of um, wanting to see, like all these buses would go there, they all had it written on their darshan. That was the purpose of the whole pilgrimage was to see, to see what, to see our own mind. Like sometimes we do this, you know, extra step to the side in order to arrive in the center. You know, we like, it's like maybe the little dance play step that we do to like, you know, come to Queen College <laughs> in order to look at your mind, you know? I mean, it's like, I think an answer, a question of why does not really ever answer it. And that's uh, the beauty of it, I feel, that both can be there. You can always be all of it. 
that you don't have to um, lose anything. And yet we do want to, you know, make this practice of keep opening our heart and and play with, you know, direct ourselves to um, give ourselves um, thank, devote, revere, honor, praise, love, care. Um, it makes us human and it makes it um, more fun. Yeah. So if there's any more question, I um, uh, thank you for coming online or in here. Um, and beg you to, in the next uh, hour, days, months, and years, to continue um, deeply trusting your heart, seeing how beautiful you are, trusting the love that you are, and uh, share it. Yeah, and, and.